Yeah. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nick Tyler. Uh, I'm part of the Data and AI Services Group. Um, and I'm going to be talking about running some jobs on Perlmutter. Um, so I'm going to cover a lot today. Um, I know that there are people who are new to HPC here. Um, so if it is, welcome. Um, I'm going to be talking about kind of what a job is um, and how we run our code as a job uh, here. Um, also, that'll go to anyone who's new to NERSC. Um, so you might be familiar with, with submitting jobs already, um, but we have some uh, different ways of submitting jobs um, and making sure that you're you know, charging to the right place and using the, the system efficiently. Um, there's also all the, a script generator, which is a very helpful way to go and start out with writing a script um, that's in our, um, in our docs to be able to start doing that. Um, and there'll be some more on job performance and profiling tomorrow at 10, if that's what you're interested in. So some basic job submission. Um, first, what is a job? So if you're you're not familiar, um, a job is, uh, um, so when you connect to Perlmutter, you're gonna be on a login node and those are shared resources. Um, and it's basically, it's where your Jupyter sessions would end up as well. But we want to keep those uh, open for people to be able to, to log in and compile their code there. So it's not meant for doing large compute tasks. And so instead, you should go and submit a job for this. Um, and so because we have, you know, almost 5,000 compute nodes, um, about a little over uh, or a little under 1,800 GPU nodes and a little over 3,000 uh, CPU nodes for this. So you're going to want to go and submit a job in order to do your work. Um, so there's two ways that we can get a compute node. Um, one of them is with an interactive job. And so you're, that's directly, uh, connecting to, to the node. Um, it'll be a command line interface or through a Jupyter notebook. Um, or you can submit a batch job. So this is going to be writing a script that will be, uh, submitted. It will sit in the queue and wait for some resources in order for that work to be done. Um, here at NERSC, we use Slurm as our job manager. Um, so it's an open source tool that performs all the scheduling for us. Um, and it helps to take care of a couple different responsibilities for us. So it allocates the resources for your job. It executes and monitors all of those, uh, all the parts of your job as it's going through. And it manages priorities of um, specific types of jobs. So whether you're in uh, the interactive queue, for instance, um, has a higher priority. So those jobs will start a lot faster than a job that um, is not in that queue. So even if you're familiar with Slurm, possibly at a different site, maybe at your university or a different um, DOE site, uh, our Slurm might be configured differently. So it's important to know about some of those differences. Um, so one of the things is we can go and get a uh, interactive allocation. Um, the way that we can get an interactive allocation here at NERSC is with the salloc command. Um, salloc is uh, for slurm allocation, and it gets you an allocation or a set of nodes to be able to use. Um, so this defaults at NERSC to being to running your, your login shell. So you can see here in the, uh, the screenshot, I did a salloc command. Um, slurm said that my job was waiting. It got me some resources. It got me a node to use. And then it put me onto that node. And you can see my uh, terminal change from saying login node to uh, the node number that I was on. Um, so what did I just do? Um, so the command itself, I said salloc, um, which is the ask for a compute node. Then I gave it my account information. So what account you wanted to be charged to. This is going to be, you can find this in Iris. Um, it usually starts with an M, but there's some other uh, accounts that don't. So... Um, most likely it starts with an M. I asked for uh, N of one, so that was one compute node. Uh, I asked for T of 10, so for 10 minutes, I wanted to reserve that node for myself for 10 minutes um, and asked for a GPU node. So the way that we ask for GPU nodes versus CPU nodes is with this constraint flag. Um, so the constraint would either be CPU or GPU, depending on what you want. Um, you can also get interactive jobs um, through Jupyter. 
So in the Jupyter Hub uh, login page, you'll see that there are some extra options uh, to the right hand side. The first one on the left will get you just a login node, the same way that you'd SSH in or for Jupyter. Um, and then everything on the right hand side will get you um, some kind of configured job uh, that runs on one of these compute nodes. There's some more information that'll be about that tomorrow as well. Um, so when would you use an interactive job? So you're going to use interactive jobs a lot of times when you're trying to test and debug your code. Um, it's also a good way to, if you want to, if you're profiling your code, you want to be interactive, you want to maybe start up and, and recompile something really quick to see how that changes performance. Um, and so in our interactive queue, you can get between uh, one and four nodes for a max of four hours. Um, we also have a uh, shared interactive queue where you can get up to half a node for four hours. Um, so that would be up to two, two GPUs um, or uh, 64 cores on the, uh, G or on the CPU uh, side. Um, but what happens if you need more than just that? You need more resources than just a little bit that you can get from the interactive. So that's when you would have a batch job. Um, when writing a batch job, uh, once you submit it, it submits work into a queue, and then you wait there for Slurm to schedule your work. Um, so it allows Slurm to give your job more time as well as more compute resources. Um, and so you can see here, I have the uh, sbatch command, which is the way that we would submit our jobs. Um, so yeah, so, so like I was saying, the Slurm uh, sbatch is Slurm batch. Um, and so you pass in a script that you want to run um, into this Slurm command and it will return back to you a job ID. And so what does the script look like? Um, so all of the options that I have for that saloc, um, there's similar options here for uh, for my script, except now I'm going to put them um, in this special sbatch comment. So that Slurm reads those sbatch comments and then translates those to those command line arguments that you might get. Um, so in this case, I asked for four nodes for eight hours with a job name that I called science so I could know when, what to look for in the future. Um, and then for the outputs and errors, I put these uh, special little characters, which will rename my output and error files to give for things like the job name, the job ID. Um, Slurm has a lot of options for, for these, but it's sometimes better than just having um, the generic output that says Slurm and then just the job ID. Um, so as part of uh, when Slurm submits your job, it actually does a couple of nice things for you. So it does things like um, uses uh, some environment variables that get stored that you can then use inside of your job, um, inside your job request. Um, when you're also running things in a job, you might want to use srun. So, so srun is um, the Slurm run command. Um, it's going to be kind of the equivalent of MPI run if you've used that before. Uh, but the S run is a little bit better because it actually interacts and talks with our uh, Slurm scheduler that MPI run might not talk to. Um, and so for this case, uh, what I'm doing is I wanna make sure that I uh, am getting a different host name for all of the nodes that I have. And so I'm running um, my S run command with the number of nodes that I'm getting from the Slurm environment variable and then just running the host name command. So I can see that I'm running on all the different nodes. So you can use these uh, Slurm environment variables to do some, some cool math to be able to uh, help you out when you're, when you're running jobs. So this was something that maybe you want to go back and reference. Um, but so some of, this, some of the uh, Slurm environment variables you might need, um, you can do the Slurm uh, number of nodes. Um, that can be helpful. Um, you can also see the number of tasks that you've asked for per node, the number of CPUs on that node, and the number of GPUs on the node. And so then you could use those to know um, the total number of CPUs, tasks, et cetera, that, uh, that you're using. Um, so what are the different queues that we have? So um, there are a couple different queues that we have. One is the debug queue. Um, so that's going to 
hopefully give you a little bit faster turnaround because uh, you, the, there's some limits on the number of nodes that you can use. So you can use between one and eight nodes um, with a half an hour max uh, wall time. And this is really good for testing your scripts out, making sure that they run, um, and maybe some scaling tests before you start running larger jobs. Um, then once you're ready to run uh, larger jobs, you're probably going to want to use the shared or the regular queue. Um, so this gives you a longer uh, wall time on your job. So your job can run up to um, 24 hours. And it allows you to submit a lot more jobs uh, into that queue. And then they'll just wait in that queue. And so the way that we change this is with that uh, minus Q flag or, or minus minus QoS flag um, to be able to, to change which, which queue you're going to go into. Uh, I will note by default, if you don't put any queue down, if you don't put any queue information down, you will default into the debug queue. Um, so if you run into problems that you're trying to increase the number of nodes and, you, and you're getting an error from Slurm, make sure that you look into what queue you're trying to run in. So again, we can go and we can debug our script um, using this debug queue, but there's some nice things about uh, Slurm as well. So Slurm will actually uh, use the command line options um, and that will override any of the options that are inside your script. So let's say that um, you wanna use the debug queue to go test your script real quick. You can have your full script saying that you wanna use the regular queue with many nodes on it, um, but you just wanna make sure that it's running quick. You can go and uh, change it from the command line like, like I have here with the debug queue. This is also nice for being able to scale. Um, so you can have the same script, um, but change the number of nodes as you might wanna scale and see how your, how your uh, workload scales. So how are we going to see once we've submitted to the queue that our job is running? So you can use SQ, which is the Slurm queue command, um, and it gives you information about some of your jobs um, and returns some information about, uh, at, by default, it's going to return all information about all the jobs, um, which can be a lot for a system like uh, here. So we have an actual, a little um, CLI tool called SQS which is a shortcut that gives you just your jobs back and gives a nice output to see uh, what's happening. Um, so some things to note here, uh, if you look at the part that says um, state, um, the state portion here is gonna tell you what the job is doing at the moment. So right now in this, I have one job that is running with the R uh, there and then one job that is pending, which means that it's still sitting in the queue with that PD. Uh, another thing to note is the um, time. The time will give you um, how long that job has been running. So for here, this first job has been running for 50 seconds. Um, and this job, because it's pending, isn't running yet and has a pending of, or a time of zero. So what happens if you made a mistake? You don't wanna use up your hours. Um, and so if you have a job that you submitted and you don't actually want that job or the job um, isn't doing what you, you want it to do, you can actually cancel that job with the S cancel command. And that'll send a stop signal to the job um, and Slurm will, will get rid of that job for you. So how do we look at our completed jobs? Um, a way to look at your completed jobs is with the SACT command. Um, so that's the Slurm accounting, um, and it will give you accounting data uh, for all the jobs and all the job steps as well inside of that command. Um, so anytime that you run S run inside of your command or inside of your script, it will put a different job step in there uh, as here. So, so for here, I ran an S run that did an LS CPU, and you can see that that uh, put it down as an extra part in the job step. So that can help you to see if, if maybe one part of your job is failing um, versus other parts uh, completing fine. Um, by default, uh, this S account command will give you uh, all the jobs that were that have been run within the last day. Um, but there are other parts of the S account command to see um, either specific jobs uh, or for larger time ranges than just the previous day.
Uh, yep. Oh, here. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So if you want to see information about a specific job, you can go and use the uh, job ID. Um, and then there's also some search features in in S account as well. So me, I know that I named my uh, my job name science, um, and I knew that I was running on the GPU nodes. And so you can use this S account to go and get either specific names or constraints to filter out your jobs for things that you know that you wanted um, to look for. Okay. Next, I'm gonna go on to running jobs and containers. Um, so containers are a great, a great way of making your software portable um, so that it can run on many systems. Um, it can also be a really great way to decrease the start time for larger jobs, especially with uh, jobs like a Python job. So um, as you start up a Python job, Python is gonna read in a lot of uh, little tiny files. And by using a container, you can actually uh, get some benefits for how all those files are read in uh, to your compute job. Um, so NERSC has two different container technologies. Um, one is Shifter, and the other one is Podman HPC. Uh, Podman HPC is a, a newer uh, thing that we've developed, and um, it allows you to actually build your Docker images on login nodes. Um, so at present, we don't support Singularity or Apptainer on Perlmutter. Um, so if you're from a, have a different site, other sites might use those, um, but we don't support that as uh, on Perlmutter. So a little bit about what a container is. So it's a way to pack up all of our software. So Docker is usually uh, the name of one of these technologies that's used. Um, and it's a very common uh, tool in, um, kind of in cloud and open source computer computing uh, is, is Docker. Um, and the idea of Docker is that you would build your code, um, you would then ship your code or push it somewhere and then run your code. So here we have uh, an example of what a, a Docker file might look like. Um, it gives you some, uh, you get to choose what operating system you want. You can install the packages that you uh, want to install as well as run any other kind of install, like maybe a uh, building some code here, or in this case, I'm installing uh, pandas. Um, and then we can copy our code into the container itself. Um, and then, uh, yeah, build our code and make sure that it's running. Um, so then where do I ship it? Um, so uh, one of the ways that you can ship your container is with uh, our registry. So we have a way for people to um, upload containers called registry.nurse.gov. Um, and so you can then uh, build your container on your local machine uh, with a Docker build, and then you just add this tag to it to make sure that you're wanting to upload to your account. So the way that it works is that um, each project will have its own, uh, its own part in registry, its own little section in registry. And so you should be able to um, tag it with your project name, that M account that you use for uh, Slurm. Um, and then to, to actually upload that, you can log in uh, with a, log, a Docker login to registry and then push that uh, up, to, uh, up to the registry. And then once it's up there, you can then run this with Shifter Podman. So in order to do that, on uh, Perlmutter, you'd want to do something like this. So you'd want to do a shifter image pull and then whatever you named that image. Um, for shifter, there's a, a part that we can put into sbatch, the image uh, flag, which will actually go and do some um, nice things to be able to load your image onto the compute node that you're running on. Um, and then instead of just running your regular command, you're going to want to make sure to add this uh, shifter part that will tell Slurm that uh, what you want to do in this step is actually run inside that container instead of inside of the regular uh, compute environment. Um, so there's some extra options for shifter that can be helpful. Um, so one of these is the uh, volume. This will help you to go and mount um, things like your scratch directory into a different place inside the container. You can also set up uh, environment variables. So maybe your code needs some environment variables set for it to run properly, and you can pass these into the container. 
Uh, you can also clear the environment from uh, outside of the container so that there's nothing from your regular shell affecting what's inside the container, um, as well as changing where, where you're working. And then we also have some modules in place. Um, so these will be so that you can choose different versions of MPI as well as uh, nickel. Um, and then uh, uh, also for uh, GPUs to make sure that it, it has access to the GPUs. Um, so we also have Podman HPC here. So this is a newer um, part. The original, the first parts are the same. You would do the same kind of uh, push and then but instead of doing a shifter image poll, you can do a Podman HPC poll on the same uh, thing. Then to run, uh, you would run um, now Podman HPC, the Podman HPC run command with the image that you want to run um, in a very similar way that you would uh, with shifter. Um, but one advantage that we have here at NERSC is that you can actually build these images directly on our login nodes. Um, so to do this, if you have your image file, the one that I showed you at the beginning, that Docker file, um, you should be able to do a Podman HPC build, um, and then you can give that a name. And then instead of shipping it uh, up to the registry or somewhere else, we can do a Podman HPC migrate. Um, and so what this will actually do is it will, uh, instead of, uh, uploading it over the internet, it will actually just put that onto your Scratch file system so that it's able to be used uh, in your job. Um, a nice thing about Podman HPC as well is that if you're familiar with Docker, all the options uh, should be the same. So you can use all the same options that you would with Docker. Um, we've just added some extra options to help out with different modules. So. Um, to make sure that you're you have the right MPI, to make sure that you have the the right things to have GPUs working or CUDA MPI, um, there's just some extra modules that we have installed with the Podman HPC, which is different than Podman. Okay, um, so you might also be running more than just a single job, um, and maybe you need to run a whole workflow of jobs. Um, so yeah, so there's might have many executables either sequentially or simultaneously. Um, there's ways that you can use a Slurm job array if you're familiar. Um, so that would be something that you want to run the same type of work, um, but maybe with different inputs. Um, we also have some workflow tools that we support here. Um, so one of the, the easiest ones to get started with is GNU Parallel. And it allows for many small tasks to be fit onto one node. So instead of having to request um, many small shared jobs, you can ask for one uh, large uh, allocation and then one node, and then use GNU Parallel to uh, get many tasks done at the same time. We also have some more um, complex workflow tools um, and there's documentation, uh, there's lots of documentation on our docs page about these workflow tools. Um, and we're also always helpful, happy to help you uh, on help.nurse.gov. Um, so how do we can how can we bundle work into one job? Um, so bundling jobs with Slurm, you can um, run some uh, programs sequentially if you'd like to. Um, so uh, instead of having to wait for the scheduler to give you um, different numbers of node or different nodes for different tasks that you can fit onto the same number of nodes, we can reuse the allocation uh, for different steps in our workflow. So here I have an example where I've asked for four nodes, and then I have um, three different executables, A, B, and C, that I'm going to use uh, different numbers of tasks and different number of cores that fit into this four nodes um, and be able to run them all uh, one after each other sequentially. Um, sometimes you can also run your work simultaneously. So maybe you have a, the same program that can fit onto these four nodes, but uh, you have different inputs for them. So a way to do this is to um, make sure that you add the ampersand at the end uh, of your srun command. That'll make sure that it um, goes into the background and lets the next command start. And then we're also going to want to make sure that we add this uh, wait at the end. That makes sure that um, Slurm won't just close your job as soon as you uh, submit your last work. 
um, and then it'll wait for all of those tasks to complete before uh, getting rid of your job. Um, so you can also use uh, job arrays as a way to, to do this. So um, the way that this works is that uh, Slurm manages each one of these jobs that you submit individually. Um, so if one task fails, it won't actually affect any of the other tasks. In the two previous ones, if one of the tasks failed, it could affect the, you know, the job might be canceled and then um, the other tasks won't complete. Um, so this can get uh, be a good option for getting some, maybe some large statistics done on the same type of inputs um, or maybe a parameter sweep over some, some input files. Um, again, using one of those handy uh, Slurm environment variables, we can use the Slurm array job ID, which will give you a number from this array um, for each job. So that makes sure that each job uh, has some uniqueness to it. And then you can use that Slurm array job ID in order to uh, choose what you want for that uh, job. Like I mentioned as well, um, one of the, the most easy workflow tools that we have uh, to use is GNU Parallel. Um, so you can, this allows you to, to manage tasks inside of an allocation, um, and it's great for a lot of small tasks. Um, this is also much faster uh, and better than running S runs all the time. Um, if you need to run uh, lots of S runs, then it's probably a good idea to start looking at GNU Parallel. Um, one of the reasons for this is that S run actually has to talk back to Slurm um, and ask if it can run the next part of the, the job. Uh, whereas using Parallel um, is just inside the node itself. You're not asking Slurm for anything. Um, and so it can run these uh, very fast. So in this case, um, I'm just loading the Parallel module. Um, and then I'm asking Parallel to give me 256 jobs, all of them for my program. Um, and then I'm going to put the value of this inputs into this part here. So if I had 256 or more input files, um, each one would get run individually inside of here. Um, so yeah, so we also have some uh, other um, workflow tools and management systems that we have uh, available here at, at NERSC. Um, and a lot of times these are uh, written in Python or you can define your workflow in Python. Um, and a lot of them will handle dependencies between different uh, types of tasks for you. Um, we have a, a training that we did about a year ago um, between uh, Argonne National Lab, Oak Ridge National Lab and ourselves um, with some of these tools and some, uh, some ways to run that on all of our systems. That could be helpful if you want to dig deeper into using one of these workflow tools. Um, and then also, again, reach out at help.nurse.gov if you have questions about any of these tools or that you're interested in a different type of workflow tool uh, to get started. All right, going to finish up with some best practices that we have. Um, so one thing about our job scheduling um, for best practices is each job has a priority value associated with it. So that's gonna be grouped by um, the user, uh, the QoS, um, that Q debug or regular, and the account that we have. Um, so one thing to note is that only two jobs of, the, of any of these categories will gain priority at the same time. So more jobs um, can run at the same time, but only two will age. So only two will get uh, go up in the queue. Um, during this. Um, and so the ma our main scheduler is using that priority list uh, to schedule um, all of these jobs into the future. And then we also have this backfill scheduler, which puts maybe some of the smaller jobs uh, inside of um, places where there's gaps. Um, and so to the, the best tips for that are um, using a, a larger job, one large job uh, with all the, the nodes that you need um, so that it can get scheduled first. Some other tips too are, are if you can have shorter time jobs uh, so that it's easier to schedule in the backfill um, or by using a, a workflow manager that's gonna do this for you. Um, and then you also wanna make sure that you're choosing the right time 
um, from slurm. So you want to balance between a, having enough time to run, um, but you also don't want to just say that you all that your job always needs twenty four hours if it only takes uh, five hours to run, because then your job's going to have to wait in the queue longer because uh, Slurm thinks that it's going to need twenty four hours. It doesn't realize that it only needs five. Um, like I mentioned before, we do have a job script gener generator, um, which can give you some more uh, advanced um, options for how to set up your threads, um, as well as uh, running some things with SRUN. Um, on that as well, so some of the options um, that you might have for your OpenMP codes, um, these all can be configured through some environment variables. Um, and so even if you don't uh, specifically know that you're using MP, uh, OpenMP, you might be already and not know it. Um, so it's common that uh, our uh, Blas and LaPac uh, libraries are using OpenMP, um, as well as uh, that usually goes on to NumPy and Python. Um, so one thing that, that can actually be helpful with Python code that's running uh, small NumPy arrays um, is to actually lower this um, OpenMP number of threads to be able to, to uh, for those small arrays. So it doesn't have to spin up a lot of threads for a very really small amount of work. Um, there's also some uh, options for MPI code that you might want to look into. Um, so some of these are to, to address some um, NUMA, so uh, non-uniform memory access uh, performance. So that's uh, the performance of how um, things get, uh, how Slurm's gonna go and put your actual work onto the CPU cores. Um, so a good rule of thumb is to use uh, the CPU bind cores when your number of MPI tasks is less than um, or equal to the number of cores. So then your tasks will all fit onto a core. Um, but if you're going to use more MPI tasks than cores, then it's good to use the, the CPO bind threads. Um, so then it can go in, and spread those out and not block. Um, this is also important for some of our, uh, if you have a, a hybrid code, um, one of the things to, to remember is that you're going to want to put the number of cores that you're asking per task to be greater than uh, or equal to the number of threads that you have. That'll give your uh, enough CPUs to be able to use those OpenMP threads efficiently. Um, also for uh, our GPU codes, um, you're gonna wanna, uh, I for, didn't save it, okay. Um, uh, for, for the GPU codes, uh, you're gonna wanna go and set um, things like the GPUs per task. Um, so in this case, I have um, the GPUs per task equal to uh, one here. So this will make sure that each of my tasks that I'm running have uh, one GPU assigned to them. Great. Um, so yeah, so what did we cover? So we covered what a job was. We covered how to run a job um, in a container as well as some workflow tools that could be helpful. Um, but always, uh, you know, go to our docs. We have great docs. Um, and if you don't find something in the docs or you still need help, um, always feel free to reach out uh, at help.nurse.gov. And then a couple more things that I'll point out um, is that if you're curious about using Jupyter, there's a uh, talk tomorrow about um, using Jupyter, uh, as well as if you're concerned about job performance, um, there's a talk tomorrow about job performance and profiling. Great.